Okay, we're into our penultimate section of chapter three here, our second to last, 3.6. Uh, if you're watching the schedule, you'll know that we skipped 3.5. So this is, don't mind my uh, mistake there, yours should be correct, linear functions. So we've been talking about linear equations for all of chapter three now. And now we're gonna upgrade these to linear functions because mathematics at its core is usually the study of functions. So we have five things to do in this section, five things to talk about. We're gonna first define a couple new terms. We're gonna define relation, domain, and range. And then secondly, we're going to look at how we identify functions. Thirdly, we're going to talk about the vertical line test. Or VLT. Fourth, we're going to look at function notation. And lastly, we're going to look at graphing linear functions. So let's talk about what relations are. So a relation is a correspondence. Between two sets, an input set. and an output set. I did not leave enough space here. Output set. So one set tells you the stuff that goes in, one set tells you the stuff that you get out. So we see these as equations most often in this class, but we can also represent relations as tables, graphs, sets of ordered pairs even. So we're gonna look at the first of those in a second here, but first let's talk about relations, domains, and ranges. So if we think of a relation as an ordered pair, then we know that it has an xy component, and the domain of the relation is the input set. It's the x's set of all the x components. All the ordered pairs that are in that relation, the x components are the inputs or the domain. The range of the relation is the output set or the set of all the y components of those ordered pairs. So all the y values in your ordered pairs make up your range. All the x values in your ordered pairs make up your domain. So let's look at a little example here. So we have a set of ordered pairs. This is a relation. And we want to determine the domain and the range. So the domain is the set of the x components. Now, since we have 2 and 2, we don't need to repeat 2. We have 0 and we have negative 1. That's the domain. The range, again, we have negative one twice, we don't need to list it twice, so our range is three, four, and negative one. And so simple as that. Domain is your x's or your inputs, your range is your y's or your outputs. So let's talk about what that means for functions. So functions are relations, first and foremost. That's important. They are a relationship between a domain and a range. The important part is that they are relations in which each input value is associated with exactly one output value.
So one of the things that you'll hear math teachers and other students say all the time is one output for every input. In other words, there's not going to be a single input value that gives you two output values. There's not going to be a single x that has two y's. There can be a single y that has multiple x's. So you can have 0, negative 1, 3, negative 1. But since there are two y values associated with the x value of 2 in this example, this relation determined by these ordered pairs is not a function. So let's see if we can identify these functions in the next example. We have five, six of them here. So in A, we have 2, 3, 2, 4, 0, 1. Oh, it's the same set. So this, as we just said, since the 2 repeats in the x's, it means it's not a function. We look at b, negative 1, 3, negative 2, 11, no repeats in the input, so this is a function. We look at c, the age of each person to the nearest year. So this is a function, and if we want to think about why, the input is the person, because the number is just a number, but when you assign it to a person by the relationship of their age, it becomes a function because no person is two different ages. So there's not going to be a single input, there's not going to be a single person that has two different outputs, ages. Okay, looking at d, y equals 3x plus 1, this is also a function. And the reason for that is there is going to be no number that you can plug in here that gives you two answers. 3x plus 1 will never be anything but 3 times that number plus 1. There's no numbers that when you multiply get two answers, there's no numbers when you add 1 you get two answers. And the same thing can be said for e. When you square a number that is unique to that number, 2 squared is 2 squared. You don't get two answers from it. So this is a function. Now if you're thinking, well, wait a second, negative 2 squared is the same as 2 squared, you'd be correct, except that's not giving us 2 x values that's giving or giving us two y values for one x value it's two x values for one y value and that's okay just like we talked about the negative one here doesn't matter it all matters if x's are repeated so if we look at f now x equals y squared now this is not a function this is the opposite of part e Because if x equals 1, 1 squared I'm sorry, not, not 1. If y equals 1 and y equals negative 1, x still equals 1. So now we have 1x, 2y's. 1 and negative 1. And that's a problem. That's not a function. So that's the kind of rationale you want to be thinking about. What is your domain? What is your range? Can any domain value branch to two range values? Can any x value give you two y values? And as it turns out, when we're looking at stuff like this, either ordered pairs or description or equation, it's a little bit harder to think about sometimes. So we have on our next page a pretty famous test. You've probably heard of it. Set it in our objectives. The vertical line test. So we use the vertical line test to determine whether a graph 
is a function. This is why it's so important to be able to graph equations. If no vertical line can be drawn so that it intersects a graph more than once, the graph is a function. If there's even one vertical line that intersects more than once, it's not a function. So that's, that's the important part. Even one vertical line intersects more than once, the graph is not a function. So you're not looking for all the lines to fail, you're looking for just one. So in this example, we're going to draw a couple sketches of graphs and use the vertical line test to see if they are functions. So the first one we're going to do is pretend that's a circle. It looks pretty circular to me. So if we use our vertical line test now, you just draw a vertical line anywhere. Since it's going to intersect this circle in two points, this is not a function. Circle is the most famous non-function equation that gets studied in geometry. So let's look at another graph here. Let's look at this thing. So here, draw a vertical line there, 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 there. No matter where I draw it, it never touches more than once. So this thing is a function. And then we can do one more here, since we've been doing so much lines. If we draw a line, we can see every single vertical line that we can make is never going to cross this in any spot but once. So this is also a function. And every line or lines are always functions. Now, as I said, the circle is a famous equation that gets studied. Lines are famous functions. We just spent most of this chapter studying lines. So we have to introduce a notation that distinguishes non-function equations from function equations. So to do that, we have function notation. So as I said, this is to distinguish functions from relations. We use function notation. If a relation y is a function of x, we denote it y equals f of x. And this is read exactly as I just said, y equals f of x. Oh, that's what this spot was for. Silly me. And I can't stress this enough, not f times x. So we talked about when we did our ordered pairs and intervals, we abuse notation in mathematics a lot. Parentheses can mean times. In this case, they do not mean times, they mean argument. So this is f of x. Now f is a very special letter. You almost never see it in math unless you're talking about functions so that it never gets confused because functions are so important. So the no notation y equals f of x means that y depends on x and the dependency that we are defining is named f. So f is the name of the function. It allows us to talk about it without having to list the equation every time. I can just say f of x, or you can insert any letter, g of x, h of x, l of x. So because of this, we call y the dependent variable. and x the independent variable. And if you're wondering what's the difference, well, the dependent variable cannot change. It's going to equal whatever it equals based on the independent variable, which is what we can change. So the way that we think about this is we choose an x. The function f tells us what y equals. We don't pick the y. We pick x, we get y. So 
if we're going to be working with function notation, we want to talk about function values. So I have some problems here. Find the function values of g of x. So when we see g of 1, this is not g times 1. g of 1 equals 3 times 1 squared minus 2. So we replace all instances of what x used to be with whatever we see here. 1 squared is 1, so this is 3 minus 2, which is 1. And that's our function value for a. For b, we have g of 0. 3 times 0 squared minus 2. This is 0 minus 2, or negative 2. So our function value, g of 0, equals negative 2. g of negative 2. 3 times negative 2 quantity squared minus 2. Negative 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12 minus 2 equals 10. So g of negative 2 equals 10. And part D here is really to reiterate that the replacement happens no matter what you see. So even if you have a letter, g of a is 3a squared minus 2. Now I don't know what a is. So I cannot simplify this further. We leave it just like this. Even if we have something like in part e, g of x plus h, we still replace every x with x plus h, quantity squared now. And now this one we can simplify. This is 3 times x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. It's one of our special products minus 2. And this, distributing the 3, we have 3x squared plus 6xh plus 6, oh, plus 3h squared minus 2. Now, there's no other simplification I can do, so that's our final answer. So you have a practice problem where you're doing something similar with a little bit more complicated function. So work that out and simplify everything down as much as possible. I will tell you that part E here is the challenge part. So keep that one in mind. And the last thing in this section that we're going to talk about is the definitions of linear functions. So a linear function is a function that can be written in the form f of x equals mx plus b. So now notice, this is the slope-intercept form. And the big thing is f of x has to replace y. So we know that ax plus by equals c is the standard form of a line. If y is a function of x, it has to be able to be simplified into slope-intercept form. And this is why we say every line is a function. And that is not necessarily true. There is one caveat. Vertical lines are not functions. And to make sense of that, we can do two things. One, we know it fails the vertical line test because it's a vertical line, so the one line that is itself will cross in infinite spots, not just one. And two, if y has to equal f of x, and we know that vertical lines look like x equals a, where's the y? To make the function. Well, there is none, which is why we know vertical lines are not functions. The nice thing about uh, linear functions is that there's no difference in graphing them. You get slope-intercept form right off the bat if you're given it. So you can graph it any way you choose with the slope, with the intercept. You can plug in points if you like doing that. You can calculate your intercepts if you like doing that. But there's no new rules that we need to actually graph linear functions. Okay, so in the next one, we'll be finishing up chapter three.